right? It's that road that leads up to school. Yeah. Yeah, this is Okay. We're going to get ready to start. I have word that we can get started. Okay. So, um, my name is Monica Torregrosa. Uh, I am professor of Spanish here at Holyoke Community College. Uh, I'm also the chair of liberal arts. I would like to welcome all of you uh, to this wonderful event and of course to HCC today. A special welcome to the students. Uh, uh, I have word that our author wants this to be for the students. This is for you. Uh, there are here many classes from HCC, including my own, our own over there, LC, Caribbean Identities, other learning communities. Um, many uh, of you have read uh, her memoir, When I Was Puerto Rican. Um, and a special welcome to all the schools from the area and from beyond. I understand Holyoke High is here. Uh -huh, wonderful. Um, Pablo Freire, Pablo Freire here. Pablo Freire, all right. Pablo Freire. Um, there is also a school from Boston, and uh, I'm going to ask the teacher to tell us who they are. Hello. Boston, Boston Public Schools, and this is the first high school, bilingual high school in New England. is our honored guest, also members of the community. Uh, and of course, for all the high school students here, I hope what you see today inspires you uh, to put us on your short list uh, when you make your college plans. This event uh, has been made possible uh, by a collaboration of several uh, departments and programs. Uh, such as HCC Academic Affairs, the Learning Communities Program, the, uh, a grant from the Public Humanities Grant, and the One Community Holyoke Initiative. Major funding for this program also comes uh, from an NEH grant entitled Bridging Cultures, which was born of a collaboration between Holyoke Community College and the Center for Lat Latin American and Latino Studies at UMass Amherst. In fact, today's event marks the happy ending of three years of academic work and cultural enrichment programs made possible by this NEH grant. Since the summer of 2015, a total of 18 HCC full-time faculty have participated in summer workshops facilitated by scholars from UMass Amherst Smith and Mount Holyoke Colleges, and our own HCC experts. In fact, one a workshop facilitator is here, Professor Alberto Sandoval from Mount Holyoke. Uh, he facilitated a summer workshop in the very first summer, and uh, his, we also read his works throughout the seminars. Alberto, so glad you're here. Collaborative summer workshops have helped HCC faculty from diverse disciplines enhance their classes with Latino studies content. The Bridging Cultures Grant has also brought cultural events to HCC and the community that focus on Latino arts and cultures. Today's program is, in fact, the culmination of this three-year project, a grand finale, so to speak, in which we are so grateful to be able to host such a well-known and popular author. I would like to thank all who participated in the grant. There are too many to mention, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention at least a few. Thanks to Vice President of Academic Affairs at HCC, Monica Perez, who has provided moral, enthusiastic, and financial support for this event. Dr. 
Dr. Kim Hicks, Dean of Arts and Humanities, who actually wrote the institutional context portion of the grant. <laughs> the HCC Grants Office, who uh, guided us through the grant preparation and who actually submitted and formatted the grant. The Business Office at HCC, um, especially Olesia Cherkashin, who processed many invoices, requisitions, and contracts. Yeah. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Luis Marentes, uh, who is a professor of Spanish at UMass Amherst, who participated with us in the writing, planning, and everything about the grant, and who was our liaison to the five college area. Luis, so glad you're here, and thank you for everything. Of course, um, I also would like a special thanks to my partner in crime, colleague, Spanish professor at HCC, Raul Gutierrez, without whose expertise, enthusiasm, hard work, and fantastic ability to network, this grant might have never happened. whose work, uh, whose talk is entitled Writing a Life, a Transcultural Journey. Esmeralda Santiago grew up in Toa Baja, Puerto Rico, in a one-room shack with a dirt floor and tin roof. Her family moved to New York when she was 13 years old. The eldest of 11, Esmeralda learned English from children's books in a Brooklyn library. A teacher encouraged her to audition for the Performing Arts High School, where she majored in drama and dance. After eight years of part-time study at community colleges, Esmeralda transferred to Harvard University with a full scholarship and graduated magna cum laude in 1976. After graduation, she and her husband, and, um, Fr uh, Frank Cantor, founded Canto Media, Canto Media, Canto Media, a film and media production company that has won numerous awards for excellence in educational and documentary filmmaking. With the publication of her first memoir, When I Was Puerto Rican, the Washington Post hailed Esmeralda as a welcome new voice, full of passion and authority. Her first novel, America's Dream, has been published in six languages and was made into a movie by executive producer Edward James Olmos. Her second memoir, Almost a Woman, received an Alex Award from the American Library Association and was made into a Peabody Award-winning movie for PBS, Masterpiece Theater's American Collection. Esmeralda Santiago is the only living author in this prestigious collection which also dramatized works by James Agee, Willa Cather, Langston Hughes, Eudora Welty, and Henry James. Esmeralda is not only an award-winning author, but she's also an advocate for public libraries and the arts. She has designed and developed community programs for adolescents at risk, and was a founder of DOVE, a, 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 a regional shelter for battered women and their children. She is passionate about the need to encourage and support the artistic development of young people with storytelling and media literacy. Esmeralda's memoirs and novels are a true inspiration to Latinos and non-Latinos alike, as they touch upon universal themes, such as the construction of identity, cross-cultural adaptation, and gender roles, using high comedy as well as intense drama. After her presentation, there will be a bilingual Q&A period and book signing. For the Q&A, uh, this mic will be sitting here and you can line up. She wants you to know not to be afraid. She wants to hear your questions. 
So you have to get out of your seat, come here, and speak in the mic so everybody can hear, okay? Uh, there will also be a book signing. If you are still so unlucky as not yet to own your own copy of When I Was Puerto Rican, the HCC store has copies for sale in the lobby. Uh, they want you to know that if you don't have cash, they will bring you over to the HCC store where they can accept credit cards. Please give a warm welcome to Esmeralda Santiago. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you so much. Save some of the applause just in case it's not as good as you expect. <laughs> oh, really. I'm so thrilled to be here. I am thrilled to see so many of you, to see such a diverse audience here. Um, I have to admit that I don't always get these kinds of audiences, but you are my favorites. <laughs> and I always long to be able to look out at an audience like this where I can see all the humanity that I know exists in this world. Um, how many of you come from other countries other than the continental United States? Wow, muchos. How many of you speak another language at home? Casi todos. Okay. I am, um, yeah, that, is my that was my experience. <laughs> my experience was that I came to the United States at the age of 13, as uh, you uh, have read in some of my books. And I came with pollito, chicken, gallina, hen. <laughs> Lapis pencil. <laughs> Ventana. Window. Puerta. Maestra. Y piso. Exacto. I thought I was bilingual. <laughs> Um, it took me a while to realize that even that little bit of English that I knew um, could be expanded into actual verbs and adjectives eventually, uh, and that I could add more nouns to it. And my, um, my way of doing it was that I did, um, I was introduced to the, uh, the public library near where uh, our apartment was. And that young woman who introduced me to that library, I have been forever grateful because she showed me a place where I could be warm when our apartments were not, uh, safe when our streets were not, and where the entire knowledge that every mind <laughs> has expressed was on the shelves of this uh, wonderful place called the Public Library. I began by looking at children's books with their um, illustrations so that I could kind of get a sense of the language, you know, and um, so I would look, you know, A-P-P-L-E and Apple and, um, <laughs> and um, K-N-I-F-E, Kenife. And by about a year and a half after arriving in the United States, I was reading English at a very much higher level than I could speak it. So everybody outside of my family thought I was very shy and timid <laughs> because I would not open my mouth because if I, if I went to a place and I said, may I please have some water, somebody said, wara. Yeah, why are they, you know, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't pronounce it until I went to Performing Arts High School. And at Performing Arts High School, um, there were classes for uh, diction, and that's where I began to understand that the K, if, it's, if it starts, you know, it's a silent K, and all those kind of rules that you don't need in Puerto Rico or Spanish. <laughs> so, um, so all of a sudden, a whole universe opens up because not only could I read about a world outside the doors of our apartment, but I could also begin to express what I was feeling 
about the world that I lived in. And that world that I lived in was a place full of uh, passion. Uh, those of you who are from our, our Spanish-speaking countries know what I'm talking about. We tend to be operatic. Um, we tend to be very dramatic in, in many, many respects. Uh, and I found that when I went outside of the community that I lived in, that passion and that drama and that, that stuff, it didn't really kind of, didn't work quite as well <laughs> outside. <laughs> so, so I had to learn how to behave in two different universes. Leaving the door of our apartments, I was a different person. When I was with my Puerto Rican family, and our friends, in our neighborhood, I walk like this. <laughs> but when I'm, when I'm in Manhattan, you don't move this. <laughs> you go like this. <laughs> because there's a different way of behaving. I had to learn that as a teenage girl when I'm not only trying to figure those kinds of things, but trying to understand why that was the case, why the way that I am, why am I not enough for the universe around me? And trying to feel the wholeness of who I am in the middle of a society that does not see the whole me. They see stereotypes, they see certain expectations that come from who knows where, um, but certainly not coming from me. Uh, what are those expectations? A poor girl whose mother is a garment worker who very often has to resort to welfare and um, living in a, in a neighborhood that is often violent, uh, in homes that are not necessarily um, the most comfortable places. If we didn't have enough money to pay for the heat, we had no heat. If we didn't have money for electricity, we used to have to put our stuff from the refrigerator on the window outside on the um, fire escape. We had to be resourceful about the way that our lives um, had become from the lives that we knew in Puerto Rico. Those kinds of things, when you're going through them, they are what you have to do. <laughs> you know? But then as you, as you mature, as you grow up, as you get out even further away from the doors of your apartments, you begin to ask more questions that all of a sudden become um, about you to yourself. Why am I doing this? Why? Why am I changing the way I walk when I go outside? Is that, is that right? You know? And so all of a sudden, you begin to question yourself because the questions that are coming at you are unanswerable, really, unless somebody really knows you very well and they know what's going on with you. So, so this is, it, it's a process. At, at some point, I think it was maybe towards the end of my senior year at Performing Arts after having played Cleopatra for three years because I was so exotic looking that every time they did a you know, theatrical production, I got cast as Cleopatra. <laughs> even though I have never been to Egypt or Greece or anywhere in that part of the world. Um, what I realized at, at some point, and I think I was very close to graduation, is that my job, my job now, is to create Esmeralda Santiago. <laughs> who is that person? It's the person who walks like this sometimes and sometimes walks like that. Uh, it's a person who speaks Spanish and who also speaks English. And in high school, I learned French. I don't ask me to speak now, but, but I was pretty good when I, when I was in school. Um, who, 
and if I'm creating that person, what do I want to do with that person with no resources? Well, you know, of course, education is the first thing for me. And I went to Manhattan Community College um, because I knew that I could, I could alter my, um, my classes with the great necessity that I had of also having a job. Um, I couldn't just go to a four-year school and have fun and you know, uh, not work 40 hours a week. So I went to Manhattan Community College, and, and I began to meet people who are in the same, um, in the same struggle. Uh, there were many Puerto Ricanos. There were people from Central America. There were a lot of um, Jewish kids who were not rich, <laughs> because until then, the only Jewish people I'd met were wealthy, though my teachers were all like turned out. And I'm like, oh, wow, I want to be one of those. Um, but uh, it turns out that in my, my ancestry, I am actually Jewish. Um, but I began to, to meet people who have the same kind of struggles and experiences and challenges. And um, it was a way of my feeling not quite so alone in that process. Um, although, you know, we do go through our lives alone. You know that. <laughs> Even though we, we fall in love, somebody falls in love with us. We have mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and friends and colleagues. And they are there. But ultimately, um, when you close your eyes at night, you are really alone. Um, I don't mean to depress you, <laughs> but, but it is a reality. <laughs> and the, the sooner you learn it, <laughs> the, best, the best for you. Uh, so being, so, so fee, knowing that, that I had to create this person, it gave me um, something to work with, you know, at least a goal, <laughs> at least a sense of this is what I have to do. If I want to improve my economic life, I have to do something. I either have, you know, I have to get better jobs or I have to get promoted. I have to work harder than the next person who is competing with the same job. All those kinds of things that we here in this room, I know, you all know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. We have to work harder than people who don't have these kinds of struggles, especially if we have um, issues with, with an accent. I was constantly being called out for having an accent, even though they really tried very, very hard at performing arts to make me sound like Cleopatra <laughs> and, um, in English. Um, so so that, that process of trying to, to create that person, it meant to me that I have to follow my passions um, and not just the passions of the people around me who might see something else in me. Um, the expectations for a Puerto Rican girl in Brooklyn at that time were that I was going to get drop out of school at whenever I had my first child, uh, and then I would go on welfare, and if not, I would be a puta, um, <laughs> and if not that, um, I would just sit back watching telenovelas all day collecting welfare. That was the expectation for me, which I rejected, <laughs> obviously, because... <laughs> I rejected because I had a vision of who I wanted to be, not who other people saw. And if you can, in that moment, just before you fall asleep, when you're completely alone in your space, whatever it may look like, if in that moment, just before you go to sleep, you have a sense, you, or you ask yourself, you either ask or tell yourself, who am I creating through all this work that I'm doing? 
I'm going to school, I'm having a job, I'm running from here to there, I'm taking care of kids, I'm taking care of my parents, I'm taking care of my friends, I'm doing so much stuff. Who is this person? What am I creating here? And when you come to the point where you, you make a decision, because it is a decision for you, it's your choice of who you become, then you have to work really hard at making sure that that person becomes the person you want to be to the point where other people don't see anybody else in you but you. Does that make sense? <laughs> For me, that meant I had to leave my community. I had to leave the Puerto Rican community in Brooklyn where we were being raised by my single mother. I had to leave that um, place because what I needed was not available there. It just wasn't there. There were no mentors there. You have to, I'm much older than you guys. So the only example of Puerto Ricans other than killers and drug addicts and prostitutes and people who always, if they appeared in the newspapers, had always done something bad, never something good. But the only person that I saw in the media was um, Anita in West Side Story, because she was Puerto Rican. Everybody else was from somewhere else, pretending to be us. Um, and Anita wanted Puerto Rico to sink in the ocean. So I did not want that for my island. I actually, yo la quiero elevar, no hundirla. Um, so I knew that I was not gonna become that person either, even though that was the only example available to me. So I have to create that, and I did it through reading, I did it through, through thinking, and I did it by telling myself, I am going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. I'm a great believer in lists. <laughs> I be, I'm a great believer in cons and pros. Um, I think if you're trying to create yourself, you need to be organized about that. And you have to have some real sense of where you're going. Don't just go wherever people push you because then you're not going where you want to go. You're going where other people go. So be, be selfish about that. And I had to be selfish about that. I had to leave my community, went to performing arts. It was, a, it was not easy, you know, and my, my sister were going, oh, you're just over there brincando y saltando all the time, you know. <laughs> That's what they imagined, because I'd come home with my weird, you know, Cleopatra costumes, and they thought I'm just having fun, you know. Um, but they, they could not understand it. My neighbors couldn't understand it. My aunts and cousins couldn't understand it. And I had to go and say to myself, I don't care whether they understand it. I get it. I get it. And because I get it, I'm going to continue doing what I think I need to do to become the person that I want to become. Um, I want, I'm here really for you <laughs> and with you. So any of you, if you have any questions, even though I'm talking, um, please come up. Uh, you know, there's a mic here so that um, everyone can hear what you ask. Pueden hablar en español o en inglés. No me hablen en francés because <laughs> je ne parle français. <laughs> But I would be happy to hear any of your um, questions, either about my books, my writing, my life. You know, just don't get too personal. <laughs> so, although, if you are a memoir writer, there are no secrets. <laughs> I can guarantee you. Any of you interested in becoming writers, please raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Oh, so many, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, great, I'm really happy. To, how many of you who want to be writers read lots of books? Yay, okay, you cannot be a writer if you don't read lots of books. 
and challenging books. Don't give me all that Danielle Steele stuff. <laughs> Unless that's what you want to write. <laughs> and then you can write them all. You know. Yes, ma'am. Hola. ¿Qué tal? ¿Está prendido? No. Pero I speak very loud anyway. Ah, ahí. No, sí. Sí, ahí ya. Hola, Esmeralda. Hola. Un placer tenerte aquí Muchas otra gracias. vez. Muchas gracias. Um, I too left. At age 18, I left the island. I left my, my people, everyone, and came to this town. And, um, and when I came to this town also, I needed to learn how to leave certain stereotypes. How, I mean, you just said um, you, you learn how to leave um, through reading. Um, for me, I, I had to have, there were people in my life, throughout my life, that saw the potential in me. And then, you know, I couldn't see it for myself. Mm -hmm. I guess I go to sleep too fast. It takes me a minute to fall asleep, so I can't <laughs> you know, tell myself, who are you, who are you creating? So I, I, I had people along my life telling me, you know, you should, you should go to college and leave that factory job. Mm -hmm. And then at college, I started ESL, and then you should continue. And, then con and so what I've done with my life has been because people have seen it in me and seen mm -hmm. the potential, and so I believe in them, not necessarily believe in me. What, who, were, who were those for you? Was yeah. it the reading, or was it people oh, in, in well, your life? Oh, well, thank you for, for your question, and yes, there were many people, mostly teachers, who saw something. I'm, I'm um, for those of you who know about astrology, I know very little, but I know that I am a Taurus. And, <laughs> and what I understand from people like Tauruses is that we're stubborn. Um, and so for me, if you say you should do that to me, that is not the way to make me do anything. You know, just don't should me. Um, so, but you can recommend something or you can ask me to consider something. And if you ask in that way, I will do that. And so the teachers who actually were able to reach me were the ones who, who, who were respectful enough not to tell me what I should do, but to think about what I might consider doing. And, and those were the ones that I listened to. Um, because sometimes a should is a should for the person who's telling you, not necessarily for you. Don't, you should leave your factory. Well, yeah, OK, so how do I pay my rent? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not, that kind of should is not helpful. But uh, you might consider going to Holyoke Community College part time while you stay in the factory until you're able to move up to a different um, job in the same place or in a different place, that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's, a lot of it is in, in how do you tell someone um, that you see something beyond them um, and to ha allow them to think about it. But d don't tell them that you're, you know, they should do this or that because most of us, <laughs> especially if you're a Taurus, you're not going to listen, you're not going to pay attention, you know? So, so encourage us. Uh, I had a teachers every way, I mean, all the way through, through um, uh, junior high school at performing arts. I had a teacher who was my champion, whom I still am, you know, grateful for. Um, then I went to Manhattan Community College and I had a, a professor there who was very encouraging and who never, you know, he, he could see that I was enthusiastic, but I was not very knowledgeable and I was really kind of naive and, and kind of, and, and innocent because I was una nena puertorriqueña decente. So I was kind of innocent in, of many things that I probably, if, if I had known, I probably would have avoided a lot of pain, but I didn't know it. But this, these people have kind of guided me through that, and, I, and I'm, I still remember them. But I think the thing that books allowed, though, were to show me a world outside of this very narrow universe that I was inhabiting. And because I could read um, about what's happening in the South, for example, I could understand what was happening 
in the rest of the United States. If I'm reading uh, about you know, Jane Austen, I know that there's a certain way that, that those people behaved. And, and so those kinds of things are information that, that we need as we continue to, to progress in our lives in trying to, to create something different than what the expectations are. Hello. ¿Qué tal? I prefer to speak in my language, Spanish. ¿Cómo no? I prove with you. I say congratulations first. Woman, you are the The old woman, American woman, stay here today. So, my name is Jose de la Rosa. I've been living in New York for 10 years in the Bronx. I know it's hard living in New York City. Quiero saber cómo lograste esa transferencia de New York en esa época, en ese momento tan difícil, momento de la Fania, ¿verdad? Mm -hmm. De la Fania Star. Mm -hmm. Ok. <laughs> Mucha música, sí. mucho party. Y ya usted sabe, ¿cómo usted logró ese transfer de Manhattan College a Harvard College, donde nosotros los hispanos estábamos relegados a un segundo plano? Mm -hmm. Más o menos al... El legado de la música, de la diversión, de o Latinoamérica, uh -huh. Johnny Pacheco. Toda esa ah, gente, la Lupe. La Lupe. <ríe> la reina, la Lupe. Ay, ay, ay. <ríe> ok, gracias. Solamente quiero saber. Este. Bueno, el, eh, para mí esa transición fue una, un, un proceso de 10 años. For me, the transition from um, Brooklyn and Manhattan Community College to Harvard was a 10-year process. Eso no fue de un día para otro. Um, and that's another thing. Eso es otro. Si, si te estás creando tú mismo o tú misma, no es algo que va a suceder al otro día. You know, if you're trying to create yourself, it's something that it takes some time. It won't happen overnight. Y para mí, el proceso fue, me, me fui a Manhattan Community College. Um, estudié en Manhattan Community College. Business. <laughs> Acabando de, de graduarme de Performing Arts High School, donde estaba saltando y brincando, like according to my family. Um, una muchacha con tendencias artísticas. So I was, you know, I, I, I had a desire for artistic endeavor. Pero yo sabía que I needed to make a living. So I knew I had, yo, yo, ¿en, qué, ¿en qué lo dije? ¿En inglés o en español? <laughs> Pero yo sabía <laughs> que, que tenía que conseguir trabajo, que no lo iba a conseguir como bailarina, y, y que yo era bailarina de Indian dance. <laughs> I, never, I never do things the easy way, ¿ok? Entonces, ese proceso fue de trabajando, trabajando, estudiando, estudiando, trabajando de día, trabajando de noche, o, o trabajando de, de noche en, en hospitales de 11 a 7. Eh, iba a la casa, comía algo, descansaba, y después iba a estudiar. So I, 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 would, I would get shift work um, so that I could have time to go to school during the day. So 10 years exactly to the day, 10 años exactamente al mismo día, 10 años después me gradué de Harvard. No fue un, no fue un proceso fácil, pero, pero yo bailé, I danced, I danced every weekend, I didn't give up the things that I love. Yo estaba en, 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 en Boston, había sitios donde uno podía ir a bailar. So there were lots of places in Boston where I used to go and dance. Sometimes I would be the only uh, person who knew how to dance salsa, let's just put it that way, <laughs> in my group. <laughs> um, because no me iba sola. You know, I didn't like to go by myself to bars. You know, iba a los bares. Okay, I told you I was, I, I'm still innocent in so many ways. So, um, pero, pero fue trabajo, fue trabajo. I, I worked. I gave up a lot of stuff. Yo dejé muchas cosas que, que otras personas agarran y no sueltan. Y yo solté muchas, muchas cosas. Parte de lo que yo tuve que soltar fue, fue mi familia. I had to leave my family. 
I had to leave my family because they did not understand my drive. Ellos no entendían lo que yo, lo que yo quería hacer. No lo entendían. Y porque no lo entendían, pues no me podían ayudar. So if they couldn't understand it, they couldn't help me. And so I had to, um, I had to then say, okay, you know, I love them. I visit them. I pay attention to their lives and everything. But I'm not getting the kinds of things that I need uh, here. I need to go outside. And what does that mean? ¿Qué quiere decir eso? Que ahora mismo, yo soy la mayor de 11. I am the eldest of 11 children. Pero yo no soy la primera que recibe las noticias. I'm not the first one to get the news in the family because I'm not, a, I'm not in the middle of the family anymore. Ellos viven todos cerca. Most of them live very close to each other. Y yo estoy bien lejos de, de, de ellos. I'm live very far away from them. ¿Por qué? Ellos crecieron in Brooklyn. They grew up in Brooklyn. Yo crecí en Macum, Tua Baja, Puerto Rico. I grew up in this rural little town in Tua Baja. I love being among trees and flowers and, you know, nature. Y ellos quieren poder ir a comprar pizza at midnight, you know. <laughs> I need to, if, whenever my mother used to, used to come um, to visit us, she would say, este sitio, <laughs> my, my home, <laughs> este sitio, this place. You know, if you need, a, if you need a, a cup of sugar, you have to drive for 20 minutes. You know? <laughs> And yes, I live in the middle of nowhere because nowhere is some place for me. But it wasn't for my siblings. We need, we need you in the... Unless you have a very loud voice. Let me try. <laughs> okay. Um, it, since her, I'm Janina Vargas. I moved here in 1988. I grew up in Cabo Rojo. Um, ever since Hurricane Maria, we've all been struggling with what are the right things to do? How do we help? Um, we have seen the unity of the Puerto Rican diaspora and the United States, and you recently have been really Uh, writing beautifully and eloquently about what's happening in the island. Um, that was, there was that recent article, I think you called the Puertopians. Uh, Puertopians, the rich yeah, people. Yeah, the Puertopians. So I, I was wondering if you would mind sharing some of your thoughts about the kinds of things you're seeing, communities getting together. This community has really come together. The town of Holyoke. Um, it, it just has been simply humbling to see what they have done to, to help communities. So um, if you could share some of your thoughts about what's happening both in the island and the connections with the Puerto Rican diaspora and the United States. I have to say about the Dias diasporicans, somebody called them. Um, my heart expanded. <laughs> the few weeks right after the hurricane, because the reason this disaster was so present in the media in the United States, it's because los, nos, los nosotros, los que regresamos, que hablábamos inglés, podíamos comunicar esa situación. Those of us who had gone back who could speak English, we could, we could really talk about what was going on to the media without translators. I can tell you because I, know, I have a lot of friends in the media, all those um, NBC, CBS, all those people, they just sent like people down there. They didn't even have translators because they didn't think they would need it, not because they thought there were English speakers there, but because they thought they could manage it on their own with their own producers. So all of a sudden, it's become a bigger disaster. And so they have to reach out to the people there who can speak about what they have experienced. And y yo me acuerdo, when I went to Puerto Rico, 12 years after I graduated from, um, for, no, 12 years after I left uh, as a child, graduada de Harvard, 
had never been on welfare, I was, had never been a prostitute, I had not dropped out, all the expectations, I did not fulfill none of those bad ones, right? So I was very proud of myself. So the Puerto Ricans that were there that had never left, they said, tu no eres Puerto Rican, yeah? <laughs> And it hurt me so much. I mean, my, it, was, it was heartbreaking for me for a few years. And now I saw that those people who went through that same experience were the ones who were speaking for those who couldn't. You know, and I'm very proud of them. I'm very proud of them that they stayed and they went through that and they just got through it. Um, the, the, the diaspora has, has really stepped up. We have, I know in my, in my particular case, living in the middle of nowhere, surrounded, I think there's only one other Puerto Rican that I know about within driving distance. Um, you know, we, I raised tens of thousands of dollars for local organizations in Puerto Rico by doing something that I'd never done is to go to my friends and say, please, you know, we need, we need it. So we, we did things that we never expected we would have to do. We did it and we continue to do it. How do we help the people who are here que están aquí que no saben si van a regresar o no? What we can do is support them, make sure if you're here, mientras, si están aquí, aprenden el idioma. <laughs> Porque no importa lo que va a pasar en Puerto Rico políticamente, van a necesitar ese idioma para poder bregar con lo que, lo que va a pasar. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so you, ha you have to, you know, please make sure that you learn as much you can the English language because you're going to need it if you do go back to Puerto Rico. In, in, in whatever your political desire is, you're going to need it because you're only going to be dealing with Estadounidense legislators. Uh, how else can we help the people here is to help them. You know, there are families here, sin carro, drive them places. If there are children that need to be babysat so that a parent can go uh, for a job interview or something like that, volunteer to do that. You can do little things. You don't have to take on their whole lives. You can take moments of their lives that will make their lives easier as they struggle with this incredible disaster that will be with them for the rest of their lives. My dad lived through San Ciprian in 1928, and he died the year before Maria. But my dad, at 95 years old, still remembered what had happened when he was seven or eight years old. So this, is, this doesn't go away for the ones who, who are still there and the ones who are here. If you went through that experience, it's gonna be with you. We need to understand that and we need to help them through that because it has been a traumatic experience. I am told that um, the time is up, yes? One more question. Is there one more question? No. No? No question? No te preocupes. No te babaches. En el, en el micrófono porque no te oigo. Yo he leído casi una mujer y cuando era puertorriqueña y a través de esos dos libros yo quiero hacerte la siguiente pregunta. Gracias. Si tuvieras la oportunidad de cambiar algo en tu vida, ¿qué sería y por qué? The question is if, um, if there was something I could change in my life, uh, she has read two of my books, what would I change? Um, I th nada. <laughs> Las, las cosas buenas son buenas, las cosas malas te enseñan. Así que, you know, good things make you happy, bad things make you strong. So, don't regret. <laughs> Never regret. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, everybody is, yes, so we're going to go out to the lobby. I'm very um, sorry that it's really, I, I could stay here for hours with you. Pero si tienen... Una más, una, ok, una más, una más, ok. Buenos días, mi nombre es Stephanie Castillo y yo he leído los libros cuando era puertorriqueña y casi una mujer. 
Y yo quisiera saber como, cuál es la experiencia de usted como latina al entrar en Harvard, como la, el impacto cultural que usted experimentó. Ok, uh, the question is about what was it like to be at Harvard. Bien difícil, no fue fácil. Es, es difícil siempre cuando tú eres diferente y el resto de, del grupo te ven de una manera que no es quién eres, sino las expectativas. Es difícil, pero uno tiene que, tiene que aprender a aguantar. You have to learn how to hold certain things and re keep the goal. Tienes que mantener esa, esa, es como una flecha. Esa flecha no se desvía, no importa lo que te digan. Y, 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 y asegúrate que va a ser difícil. No va a ser fácil. Life is not easy. Life really is, you are alone. <laughs> Estás sola. <laughs> Estás sola en tu vida. Gracias. Yeah, thank you. As well, there will be signing books outside. Do you have books you want to sign or you want to meet or talk to us? Right outside.